thanks for everyone for turning out after lunch. I'm going to do my damnedest to keep you all awake. Um, I know that can be hard after, right after you have a, a big lunch. So um, I'm going to go through, I've got 50 slides. I'm going to try to do that in about 20 minutes. So, so be on your toes. <laughs> and if you need the data slides, I'm happy to email them to you later. Um, so I want to start by making uh, a few relatively straightforward um, and I think uncontroversial un 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 propositions. Proposition one, uh, humans' <laughs> needs and wants, the things that we want, uh, generally, but especially from the environment, are also a function of our social and our ecological environment. The second proposition, that the social and ecological environment in America today is profoundly different from what it was at the time during the time that our system of conservation of wildlife evolved during the end of the 19th century. And the third, for governments, and especially for folks in here, for government agencies to remain relevant, uh, they need to make people's lives better, basically to provide the needs and maybe to a lesser extent, uh, the wants. So with those, uh, relatively uncontroversial, I, again, I hope, propositions of mine. I'm gonna ask you to do something that's a bit un, uh, unconventional for this sort of talk. So I'd like you to be, I'd like to begin by asking you to imagine what life was like for a person living in the United States 150 years ago. So in the year 1870, 152 years ago, near 1870, the US was just five years removed from a bloody civil war, a war that uh, resulted in the deaths of more than half a million Americans, uh, but also led to the emancipation of black slaves. The 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which granted all persons born and naturalized to the, in the US the equal protection of the laws, had been ratified by Congress but uh, two years earlier. And less than half, of a dec half a decade had passed since Congress enacted the Homestead Act which gave away lands at little or no cost to those with the courage to venture westward to settle, which of course required the brutal removal and near genocide of the native peoples that occupied those areas. In 1870, roughly three in four Americans lived in rural areas, and about half made their living working the land, that is through agriculture. At that time, about one about one half of the children were enrolled in what we would now consider to be primary school. And child labor was still common and would remain so until Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. So just think about that, 1938, as part of uh, then President Roosevelt's Progressive New Deal. But industrialization, fueled by technological innovation, uh, was well underway. Uh, and that was fueling uh, a variety of new occupations for laborers, freeing people from subsistence lifestyles. However, of course, many of those jobs were dangerous, especially as workers lacked protections. And in, uh, this is kind of unbelievable, in 1870, as late as 1870, the life expectancy of your average American was 39.4 years. This is just 150 years ago. Science, technological innovation, uh, modern medicine, they had a lot to do with dramatically increasing life expectancy and overall human well-being. Uh, but the shift was also in fuel, fueled by industrialization, protections for workers, and an economy that grew rapidly in the wake of World War II. You can see, uh, there's an indicators, the relatively dramatic change uh, in well-being that occurred from 1870 to, this goes up to 2010. So uh, according to this guy, uh, Ron Linkelhart, uh, he's a political scientist from uh, <clears throat> that school of north, uh, <laughs> the dramatic increases in wealth associated with industrialization um, rapidly diminished people's existential threats. So uh, essentially, um, life was a lot easier for us to live. Um, there were much less, the environment became a much less threatening place. And that prompted a dramatic shift in social values. 
Uh, first values shifted away from traditional religious values toward what Engelhardt called secular rational values, uh, where gradually religious leaders uh, were replaced by scientists uh, as the arbiters of how we understood our world. Next value shifted along a second dimension as social priorities transitioned from those focused on meeting basic needs to what he called higher order concerns such as social affiliation and freedom of self-expression. These concerns Engelhardt calls post-materialist values to reflect the move away from having met materialist or subsistence concerns. This work, which dates all the way back to the 1960s, um, Engelhardt and colleagues uh, have documented long-term shift away from materialist and post-materialist values. This figure, for example, just documents changes in values of uh, six European societies for which they had the longest-running survey data. And you can see there basically this generalized shift um, from on, I guess be on your, your left, uh, the materialist values uh, toward the post-materialist. So um, one of my colleagues, or a couple of my colleagues were very much affected by this. And in a series of papers that started back in the mid-1990s, uh, Mike Manfredo at Colorado State and colleagues argued that the process of modernization that was occurring may also have promoted a shift in the way people view and value nature and wild animals. So historically, the predominant cultural orientation, they said, uh, the one firmly in place in the 1870s, was one that viewed wildlife in very narrowly utilitarian terms. They were either resources or impediments to obtaining resources to be used by humans. So therefore, when their interests were considered at all, uh, they were subordinate to human interests. Uh, we call this orientation domination. Culturally, domination is expressed in the traditional religious values of early Protestant Americans via Genesis, which gives humans dominion over the, <clears throat> over the earth and every living thing. So domination is from dominion. Some people think it's you know, being critical by saying that, but it's coming directly from the dominion. Uh, it was also expressed in doctrines of the time, such as Manifest Destiny, which held that the United States was destined by God to expand its dominion uh, and spread democracy across the continent. Population growth, rapid technological innovation, and capitalism utterly unimpeded by environmental regulation, when combined with this philosophy that demanded the conquest of nature, pr proved catastrophic, as I think we've seen for North American wildlife. And by the end of the 19th century, wild animals that were deemed useful were often overexploited, uh, as exemplified by the rapid loss of wild ungulates such as bison. Likewise, wild animals that proved problematic for people were mercilessly persecuted. We removed large carnivores with typical American efficiency. Uh, for example, it took just three decades of wolf bounties to functionally eliminate wolves from the state of Montana. In our own state of Ohio, all terrestrial mammals with an average body weight greater than uh, 10 kilograms from bison to lynx were eradicated before the turn of the century. Okay, enough bad news. I'm gonna switch gears. <laughs> so the changes associated with modernization also helped begin a shift in our collective thinking uh, about wildlife that we call mutualism. So, in contrast with domination, mutualism views wild animals in more egalitarian terms, whereby wildlife uh, animals generally are members of the broader social community, des deserving of care, compassion, and fair treatment. I think I've probably shown you guys this slide before. Um, to better understand modernization and how it's affecting Am Americans, we, uh, uh, how Americans view wildlife, we created a survey instrument that measures these two orientations uh, and allows us to place individuals along those corresponding continua. So overlaying these two continua allows us to classify people into one of four groups. And this is just sort of a shortcut to help people understand and speak about these ideas. So we call uh, traditionalist people that are low in mutualism and high in domination. That's the prevailing cultural orientation. Those that are high in both mutualism and domination are called pluralists. Distance are those that are low in both. Mutualists are those that are high in mutualism and low in domination. 
So uh, to investigate the role of uh, value orientations in wildlife conservation, we conducted surveys, uh, I think we're over 45,000 adult Americans now, with representative samples in all 50 states. This is by a long shot the largest study of its kind. Uh, the effort, which was led by Mike uh, Manfredo and Tara Teal, um, at CSU replicated surveys that were done in 19 Western states that were conducted back in 2004, which allows us to determine if, if and how values have changed. So what did we find? Again, I've reported on some of this before. Some of what I'm gonna show you today is, is new. So first we compared the data uh, from the 2018 efforts to data collected back in 2004, and consistent with our theory, we found that the proportion of mutualists is increasing, while the proportion of traditionalists is decreasing. So you can see here the proportion of mutualists represented uh, in, on the map in green rose from 26%, or 20, roughly 27% to about 32%. Uh, the proportion of traditionalists decreased from about 40% to about 33%. So our data also now allows us to compare the values uh, across all 50 states. So here in green uh, is the proportion of mutualists. What I'm about to do is I'm going to flip-flop this and show you the proportion of, of the state that's occupied by traditionalists. So here, uh, the, the darker values represent uh, a higher proportion of mutualists. So you can see um, uh, the coasts, California, and the northeast, you see the highest proportion uh, of mutualists. Um, and we'll just sort of watch what happens. You can basically see that traditionalists kind of show up in the inverse, right? So we see the highest proportion in the uh, uh, northern Midwest, Rocky Mountain states, and the southeast. Okay, so this is the, the big question though, what drives change? So uh, Engelhardt, remember our political scientist from the guy of North, uh, the School of North, uh, Engelhardt hypothesized that value sh shift is driven by intergenerational replacement. So that is basically when older people die off, they have one set of values and they're replaced by a young, younger group of people or a new cohort with a different set of values. So we find evidence uh, uh, for this type of, of change, uh, as exhibited here by differences between these generational cohorts. Okay, so you see um, the mean represented there um, <clears throat> by the red bars is increasing from the greatest generation up into Gen X. So this is data from the 2004 survey in red. Now you compare that to the data there's the line, it's relatively linear. Here's the data from the 2018 survey. Um, so we also see differences um, within those cohorts between the 20, 2004 and the 2018 data, suggesting that values might be shifting within individuals as well, right? So the cohorts themselves have shifted between time point one and time point two. Same age cohort, same group of people. Um, but the values are higher in this second study. Sorry, I'm trying to unpack that for you all. So, what drives this change? So, uh, the three factors that Engelhardt hypothesized to bring about uh, change uh, is indicators of the role of modernization, education, and urbanization and income were all significantly and positively related with the proportion of mutualists at the state level. So again, to unpack this for you guys a bit, here each of these graphs, and I know they're really small, I apologize for that. Each of those dots represents a state. It's graphed against the modernization variable, variables that are on the vertical axis, so education, urbanization, and income. And then on the horizontal axis, uh, we see the percent of mutualists. So um, to kind of summarize this, first part for you guys. Our theory and findings mirror Engelhardt's in so much as we attribute value shift primarily to economic modernization, uh, which increases uh, human well-being. However, modernization is also changing how changing human lifestyles in a manner that impacts uh, how humans interact with our environment, and importantly, whether those interactions are perceived as threatening or beneficial. Uh, we believe those changes uh, may not only drive value shift, but also have real consequences for how we 
interact with our environment in the future. So what I want to do with the remaining time, real quickly, is to turn to the implications of social change. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm summarizing stuff that's been in the literature now for, well, most of these studies were published in the last basically two years. Um, but I want to show you some new things. Um, so um, perhaps the most obvious, this is again, this is one that I've shown you guys before, one of the most obvious predictions from our theory of value shift is that mutualists should be more likely to moralize animals. Uh, that is to view animals as generally morally relevant. Um, and again, as I reported to this group back in 2020, we found that consistent with our expectations. Uh, individuals express stronger mutualism values. Those individuals that express those values were more likely to agree, for example, that people have an obligation to avoid actions that harm individual animals. However, and interestingly, they were also more likely to agree that people have a duty to conserve wildlife for future generations. So this suggests that wildlife values and the shift in wildlife values could actually lead to a population uh, that is more supportive of conservation broadly. So here's a new analysis that I um, conducted with an undergraduate student this past year. So we looked at 49 state ballot measures that occurred from 1990 to 2016 uh, that concerned the welfare of animals. So this is aggregating those measures that uh, dealt with wildlife along with those that are dealing with domestic animals as well. So these are all state ballot measures. We found that states with higher levels of mutualism more likely than those with higher levels of domination to pass ballot measures with a pro-welfare outcome. <laughs> Moreover, residents of uh, those states were more than twice as likely to actually introduce those measures in the first place. One of these measures, actually not one that dealt with welfare, uh, but a ballot measure that passed um, in 2020 asked residents of Colorado whether the state should reintroduce gray wolves. And we wanted to ask the data that we have, uh, is Colorado an appropriate place for wolves? So we went to the America's Wildlife Value Study uh, to estimate both wildlife values and tolerance uh, for carnivores across the US at the county level. So because some of the uh, states we collected county level data, we can actually take that data uh, and use the data that we have counties for and project uh, using correlates, uh, what the counties that we don't have data for would look like. Okay, that's the very simplistic version of how this gets modeled. And that allows us to create a map. Uh, this map displays the projected sociocultural support for wildlife at the county level uh, based upon correlates with those wildlife values. Uh, essentially, the dark brown places are places where domination values are very high. Uh, blue values are places where mutualism values uh, are predominant. And you'll note that, the, that there's a strong correspondence between urban areas and, and mutualism values in the data set. Uh, I need to back up. So the reintroduced wolf population in the northern Rocky Mountain states of Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana uh, has since moved west into Oregon, Washington, uh, and the smallest circle here represents that. Wolves, of course, are also present in the Great Lakes states. So here our data show that the social values uh, are not particularly favorable to wolf conservation in those areas where, they, where we already have them, especially in the place that we reintroduced them in the mid-1990s. But what about Colorado? What about this proposed reintroduction site? Uh, here the data suggests that the tolerance for wolves is likely to be far greater than it is in the Northern Rockies. Uh, that is in, in Colorado in this proposed uh, recovery era, area. And there is a, an easier way to see this. This is one way of looking at it as a map. Here's another way of looking at it. So the red dots up there are Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, the states where the Northern Rockies where wolves uh, were reintroduced. The yellow line there, the yellow dot, is Colorado, and graphed on that Vertical access is the percent who agree that wolves that kill livestock should be in turn killed. So you can see the relatively dramatic difference between the, the Northern Rocky states and Colorado. So uh, generally when my colleagues and I talk about this data, 
um, we're pretty quick to emphasize the potential for social conflict, and that's what everybody wants to talk about. Um, and I think, in fact, that's largely what I just did for you. But I've also been curious about our collective conservation priorities, our vision, if you will, uh, for wildlife conservation. So what, if anything, do shifting values imply for those priorities? Uh, this is the question that Christina Slagle and I have been exploring in a study that is just wrapping up. Um, so like Kendra's data, this data is like, literally I, had, I took it off of a server from Qualtrics last night. So I was running an LSC server last night. Um, so I'm gonna give you a very simple uh, analysis or a, a peek, a sneak peek if you will. So uh, to address the question, we asked Ohio residents to rank uh, a set of five priorities, uh, eight actions that management agencies commonly uh, engage in, or activities that they engage in, um, including restoration of extinct or imperiled species, increasing opportunities to hunt and trap, uh, purchasing or leasing lands for recreation, management of existing lands to improve habitat, and removal of invasive and exotic species. Now I know there's a bunch of other things that you guys do, but we didn't want to put in like we thought about like maybe we'd have a section that's like uh, doing lots of bureaucratic paperwork, but we figured not a lot of people would jump on that. So, um, and in these ranking procedures, you can get to about six or seven and cognitively they get pretty tough on people. So we had to leave a few things out. Um, so what did we find? So this figure shows the average rank uh, across a total sample of 500 residents. Um, that is in green, uh, and then those who strongly or very strongly identified as conservationists, so they self-identified as conservationists. Um, so just as a reminder here, when you're looking at rank, lower is better, or lower would be a higher priority, I should say. So a few uh, takeaways from, from this. Uh, the priorities of conservationists do not differ from those of the broader public in this sample. That's probably a good thing. Um, both are emphasizing management of existing lands uh, and restoration of extinct or imperiled species. Um, now here's the interesting thing. What, what do you think is going to happen when I add a sample of licensed hunters? <laughs> Some people are laughing, so they think something is going to happen. Actually, really interestingly, the first three priorities don't differ hardly at all. There's very little difference in those priorities. Um, so. I, I don't know if that's surprising to me or not. I didn't really have any expectations here. I was sort of hopeful that they would align perfectly because that would be, gosh, that would be really convenient, wouldn't it? Um, and it would sort of go against the grain of all of the uh, conflict that we talk about. But uh, these last two really throw us off, okay? So uh, hunters were far more likely to emphasize uh, uh, increasing opportunities uh, to hunt and trap species, probably, not surprisingly, um, whereas uh, uh, they were far less likely to emphasize the restoration uh, of locally extinct or imperiled species. So you're probably asking, um, what about the values? The, this talk was about changing values, right? So I haven't had a chance to do that yet. That requires a, a bunch of analyses that I was not going to be able to do last night. <laughs> So, um, so maybe next year. Uh, but uh, so I haven't had a chance to do the wildlife value orientations, but I did run them by age cohort very quickly, and the age cohort priorities for the youngest age cohort, so people that were born after 1980, pretty much reflected the, the population of people that identified as conservationists. So they look more like the general public, more like uh, people who are identified. Actually, the number one priority there was restoration. So the point of the analysis is, is very simple. If we want conservation to appeal to younger generations, we need to align what we produce with their priorities. I think the same is true if you making a product for anyone, for any group. Uh, if you want to be perfectly, uh, I, or I want to be perfectly clear about something. So I, I don't want anyone to walk away from this suggesting that the agency, or thinking that I'm suggesting that the agency should give up on providing hunting opportunities. Uh, rather, what I want to suggest is, is that agencies, for agencies to remain relevant, they need to produce things that people value. 
the younger generations appear to prioritize, want, value, whatever, use your word, uh, different things from their agencies. So I'll, I'll add, restoration of species um, that hunters also find desirable seems to present an obvious win-win sort of scenario, right? And I know this is uncomfortable because everybody's thinking elk right now, so I'm just gonna get that out there full bit. <laughs> so, uh, to put this all in context, I'd like to return to the initial comparisons uh, of the conditions today versus 1870. And I think it's really hard to overstate just how different the social context is today. So imagine if you can, the life of a homesteader, the Western territories of the United States, uh, life without running water, without electricity, without a phone, life without cars or well-maintained roads, without grocery stores, without refrigeration or air conditioning, uh, life without any sort of social safety net. For our ancestors, the environment was a hostile place from which people sought to carve out an existence, often by any means necessary. In that environment, animals were first and foremost our tools, they were our food, and they were at least potentially threats to one's survival. It's perhaps not all that surprising that in the early system of our early system of conservation that emerged from this social context is focused on development and wise use of natural resources for human benefit. But the social context today has changed dramatically. We've developed systems that eliminate or dramatically reduce the threats posed by our environment. The wild animals we once thought of as dangerous are largely confined to spaces we don't use. They even avoid us, actually, spatially and temporally. They're no longer a meaningful threat. In fact, they've become a bit of an attraction. That happens to be, uh, there were about 200 people there standing on the hillside in Lamar Valley staring at a wolf pack about a mile and a half away. And the wilderness, once a place to be feared and conquered, has become a refuge for our recreation, a place to be protected. So in short, the social context today differs dramatically from the context in which our system of wildlife conservation evolved. Keeping wildlife management activities relevant for society in the future requires us to acknowledge these changes and their effects on our priorities in the next generation of conservationists. And using data such as these data to identify shared priorities that transcend age cohorts or value types helps us move appreciably in the direction of, of establishing a shared vision of conservation. So with that, I'd like to thank a fantastic group of colleagues and collaborators, only some of whom are on, on this, but the most important ones in the social change research. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave you with a slide that I've been working on because I, this, there's no better group of people that can tell me if I'm getting something wrong. Um, but it seemed relevant to leave off on this. So this is the presence the conservation status of large terrestrial mammals in Ohio, 1800 to 2000. So you have a timeline moving from left to right, 1800 to 2000, and you have the species, the large species that we have, uh, or our ancestors had eradicated, along with the, their current status as well. So with that, um, Gosh, we're, we're really on downer talks today, aren't we? <laughs> Sorry about that. I mean, on a big time downer note. So, um, here's an upside. Uh, I spent much of the, uh, this is total non sequitur, I spent much of the pandemic uh, relearning how to draw and paint with a couple of drawings uh, that were done out there that I uh, have out. So, if anybody wants to talk to me, talk to me about that, that's the pandemic work that I did. So, um, so here's an up, upshot, I guess. Thank you for your time and attention. It's great to be back, and it's so great to be in a room with you guys, you all again today. <laughs>